So we're in chapter 30 now, which is the third chapter in our plant unit, and we're gonna talk about reproduction and domestication a little bit of flowering plants. So again, we're doing another chapter focusing on angiosperms. Maybe I can click, there we go. So as far as angiosperms life cycle goes, um, angiosperms, remember, are flowering plants, so they're gonna have flowers that are unique to them. Um, they also have double fertilization, where one sperm fertilizes an egg and the other sperm pairs with um, the polar nuclei in the embryo sac to form the endosperm. Also, angiosperms have fruit, which matures from the ovary and is a structure that protects seeds and aids in seed dispersal. Um, in general, angiosperms have to have gametophyte development occurring, they have to have pollination, they have to have that double fertilization and seed development. So that's kind of where we're going in this chapter. So to kind of remind yourself um, about the alternation generations life cycle or the sporic life cycle, um, we've got a couple questions to review. So first of all, in plants, which generation is diploid? Is it the gametophyte generation or the sporophyte? It's going to be the sporophyte generation that is diploid. The gametophyte generation is going to be haploid. Uh, number two, which type of cell division produces plant spores? Is it mitosis or meiosis? Um, to go over that one, I think it's helpful to think about like who produces the spores. What generation makes the spores? Sporophyte generation produces spores. And then are spores haploid or diploid? Spores are haploid because they mature into the haploid gametophyte generation. So to go from diploid or 2N to haploid or N, you have to do meiosis. So the answer to 2 is B. Number three, which type of cell division produces plant gametes? Is it mitosis or meiosis? So again, I think it's useful to think about which generation produces the gametes. So the gametophyte produces gametes. Is the gametophyte haploid or diploid? The gametophyte is haploid. Are gametes haploid or diploid? Gametes are haploid. So to go from haploid to haploid, what do you do? mitosis. So number three is A. Um, that's a little bit maybe tricky or confusing for people because I think when we think about gamete production, we think about gamete production in animals and animals produce their gametes by meiosis because your diploid animal cells are making haploid sperm or eggs. So a little bit tricky on number three. Here's the alternation generations life cycle if you need to review it. Um, I put it here because I thought it was handy for you. Remember, alternation generation has, um, it has a diploid multicellular phase and a haploid multicellular phase. Um, and in this picture, they've got multicellular diploid sporophyte generation, undergoes meiosis, produces haploid spores. Those spores grow up by mitosis to form the multicellular um, gametophyte generation, which produces haploid gametes, so haploid egg or sperm, um, and to go from haploid to haploid, they do mitosis, um, and then those sperm and egg meet, and you have a diploid zygote that forms, that diploid zygote grows up to become the multicellular diploid sporophyte generation. This next slide is like really busy, um, but basically we're going to cover everything on this next slide. Um, throughout the rest of this lecture, um, but I like having it kind of all in one place. So we'll go over this now and we're going to go over it again later as well. But if we look at the flowering plant, um, they started us with number one up in this corner here. So there's microspores and megaspores. The microspores are produced in the male reproductive parts of the flower in the anther, um, and those microspores develop into mature pollen. Um, and then the pollen can meet the female reproductive structures of the plant. So when the um, pollen lands on the stigma, you have pollination occurring if they're compatible. And then the pollen um, germinates this pollen tube that has to grow from the stigma through the style all the way down to the ovary and um, to the ovule. So here, so we're zoomed in to the next step there. So the pollen tube grows to the female reproductive parts um, and reaches the female gametophyte. And then sperm goes down the pollen tube um, and fertilizes the egg 
and also it fertilizes um, structures to produce, they're called polar bodies, but it, pull, it fertilizes these polar bodies to produce the endosperm, um, which becomes a kind of nutritional tissue. And in the plant, each ovule um, can develop into a seed, and then the ovary itself um, develops into the fruit. Um, and then obviously a seed has to meet the proper conditions so that the seed can germinate, and then you get a seedling there. And again, we're gonna go over all of this coming up in kind of more detail or smaller chunks, but that's sort of the big picture of what happens in angiosperms for sexual reproduction to occur. So if we start with the flower, there's four types of floral organs. You've got sepals, um, which usually function to protect unopened flower buds. Um, sometimes this is called the calyx. And then you have uh, petals here, which usually serve in the attraction of pollinators. We call that the corolla. Um, and sepals and petals together make up the perianth. And then you've got stamens, which are the male reproductive parts. They have a filament, which is this long part that's topped by an anther here, um, which is where the male gametophyte generation is produced. And those microspores develop into pollen grains. Then you have the carpal, um, which is the female reproductive parts. You can have a single carpal or a group of fused carpals that are called a pistil, if you've heard of that before. And it's made up of the stigma, which receives pollen, the style, and then the ovary. And within the ovary, you have ovules. And again, the ovary um, can become the fruit and the ovules um, produce or they become seeds when they mature. And the ovules themselves produce the megaspores, which is the female gametophyte generation, or which becomes the female gametophyte generation. So let's go ahead and label the parts of this flower. Um, so this green part here is the sepal. Um, it looks like our little box here got a little Oh no, it's okay. This box is trying to point out both of the male reproductive structure. So what's the male structure called? That's the stamen, and the stamen is made up of the anther and the filament. <laughs> My mouse got out of control. Filament, there you go. What's the pink part? That's gonna be the petal. And then this whole thing, all the female reproductive structures together are the carpal, right? Stigma, style, ovary ovule and if you weren't paying enough attention the first time there's a picture of it for you so as far as flowers go they don't all look the same flowers can vary in the number of um, whorls they have the organ colors the flower colors um, the shape of the organs themselves, they can be fused. And then also, I said organ color earlier, that's true too, but um, flower organ number as well. So as far as variation in number of worlds goes, a complete flower has all four worlds, meaning it has sepals, petals, stamen, and pistil. An incomplete flower would have um, one or more worlds missing. Then we can have perfect and imperfect flowers. A perfect flower has both stamens and carpels, and imperfect flower is missing one of those. So we could have carpelate or pistillate flowers that produce carpels, or we could have staminate flowers that produce stamens. Um, dioecious plants are going to have staminate and pistillate flowers on different plants, and monoecious plants have staminate and pistillate flowers on the same plant. The root words are kind of helpful, helpful there, I think. Uh, what's the root di mean? Two, so that means we have two different plants, male plants and female plants. And what's the root word mono mean? One, so that means we have one kind of plant that has both male and female parts on the same plant. So number five, which of these is complete and perfect? So this first one has everything, so it is complete and perfect. The second one, is missing something. What's it missing? You're like one of these things is not like the other. So this one, the second flower is missing the semen or the male reproductive parts. Um, so what else can we call this incomplete and imperfect flower? We could call it carpelate or we could call it pistillate because it doesn't have the stamen.
As far as variation in flower organ number goes, we've already talked about this, how there's a difference between eudicot and monocot flowers. So eudicot flower organs often come in fours or fives, or multiples of fours and fives, and monocots often have flower organs in threes or multiples of threes. As far as flower color goes, this can vary as well. Um, sepals tend to be green, but can be colorful, as you can see in this um, picture here. Um, and then petals tend to be colorful, but can be green, as you can see in this picture below here. Um, so color variations arise from differences in gene action that influences uh, pigment biosynthesis. Also, flower shape can be varied because organs can fuse. Um, you can have fusion in a whorl or between whorls. Um, so oftentimes we have, maybe you've seen this before, where you've seen a, um, a flower where the petals are fused into a tube, um, or you can have uh, fused carpels like in this tulip here. So that brings us to the megaspores. So in the ovule, um, you've got a diploid cell that produces four megaspores by meiosis, and then three of those die. Um, the surviving megaspores generate the female gametophyte generation by mitosis, and the female gametophyte consists of seven cells, um, one of which is the egg cells, or the egg cell. So then microspores are, I'm going to be smaller, right? Mega is big, micro is small. So in the stamen, there's going to be diploid cells that undergo meiosis and produce four haploid spores. These are microspores. The microspores divide, producing a two or three celled young male gametophyte generation, and pollen is that young male gametophyte generation. So each male gametophyte develops a tough pollen wall, um, and this depends on what kind of species you are, what this pollen looks like. Um, however, it contains sporopollinian, which gives the pollen physical strength, um, chemical inertness, and resistance to microbial attack. So then pollination occurs when pollen makes its way to a compatible stigma. So the pollen grains land on the stigma. Um, the stigma then allows appropriate um, pollen genotypes to germinate, and it rejects pollen that is too genetically similar. So if it can germinate, um, the pollen tube germinates down through the style, down to the ovary and to the ovule, um, and then the pollen will um, discharge two sperm near the embryo sac. So pollination varies from species to species in plants, and plants have co-evolved with animals. Um, so you know, how pollination occurs depends on the species. So you can have abiotic pollination. What does the prefix a means without or not? And bio means life. So abiotic is not involving other living organisms. So this would just be like by wind. Um, this occurs in angiosperms, including grasses and many trees. If you have allergies, you're probably pretty acutely aware of uh, wind pollinated species because they can give you more trouble because um, they produce a large amount of pollen um, and it's very small pollen and organisms that pollinate by wind are going to lack nectar or scent because they don't need to attract anyone. They just need to spend their energy producing a lot of pollen. Um, then some insects like bees, um, moths and butterflies and flies and beetles um, pollinate angiosperms as well. And there's floral adaptations um, to attract different organisms. So to attract bees, they tend to have um, nectar and a sweet fragrance and brightly colored petals with kind of these nectar guides on them. Um, to attract bats, you're going to have plants that produce light colored aromatic flowers. And then to attract birds, you tend to have tube shaped flowers that are bright red or yellow and they have little odor but lots of nectar. Um, so here's a picture of that like co-evolution and uh, different types of pollination. So here's some wind pollinated plants like they're showing you. Look at how much pollen is produced by those. Um, plants that are pollinated by insects when they're under ultraviolet light, um, they appear differently. Um, that's kind of guiding the insect into where the pollen is. Um, and then here's a plant that's pollinated by a bat or a bird there as well. Some flowers kind of cheat the system and we call them deceptive flowers because 
oftentimes the relationship between a plant and a pollinator is mutually beneficial. Like the plant provides something for the pollinator because the pollinator is um, moving the pollen for them. Um, but some plants attract pollinators without providing any reward. For example, this plant up here mimics um, female insects so well. The male insect of that species is tricked into trying to mate with the flower. It doesn't get any benefit out of it. Um, and then it makes the same mistake again and again and again and um, helps pollinate that plant um, by going from one plant to another and being basically tricked. Um, this is another plant here that tricks female blowflies into visiting it because it smells like decaying flesh um, and so you know it goes from one pseudo pile of decaying flesh to another um, and pollinates that way but the flies don't get any reward for that that brings us to so we had pollination and then we had fertilization and I think sometimes people confuse this I don't know maybe like you got the birds and the bees talk when you were young and like they kind of oversimplify things or something like that. But pollination is when the pollen um, lands on the stigma and germinates. And then fertilization is just like what fertilization is when you normally think of fertilization, which is when um, the sperm and the egg meet together. So fertilization leads to the production of the young sporophyte generation that stays within the seed. And actually in plants, we have double fertilization because you get the egg fertilized and then... Um, you also fertilize the tissue that produces the endosperm, which is this triploid tissue, because if you have a sperm that fuses with two nuclei, um, and so you have haploid sperm, two haploid nuclei, they fuse together and produce the endosperm, which is this nutritional tissue um, that the developing uh, sporophyte embryo can use. So there are mechanisms that prevent plants from self-fertilizing. Some plants are capable of self-fertilization, others are not. Um, Dioecious species have stamina and carpellate flowers on separate plants, um, and they can have stamens and carpels that mature at different times, or stamens and carpels can be arranged to prevent self-fertilization in some plants. It, there's several mechanisms, like I said, that can prevent self-fertilization. Um, some plants are self-incompatible, meaning they have the ability to reject their own pollen um, some plants reject pollen that has an S gene matching an allele in the stigma cells and recognition of self pollen may prevent the pollen grain from germinating or in some families actually destroys the RNA of the pollen tube itself. So don't get super hung up on this picture. Um, I think this is from a different textbook, but I just like that it shows you that um, if you have a compatible pollen type that's genetically different enough, the pollen tube germinates. Um, and in other cases, the pollen tube would not germinate um, if it is incompatible there. Um, and in, in this one here, this is too similar to so the pollen tube germinates but doesn't grow very far there. So we got pollination, we had fertilization, and now the seed needs to develop. So the seed develops from fertilized ovules. It has a tough seed coat around it that's produced by the sporophyte integuments, and the seed contains an embryo and endosperm. The embryo is a young multicellular diploid sporophyte generation. The endosperm supplies nutritional needs for the embryo, um, and this comes from the parent sporophyte. Um, seeds go into a dormancy period, which is when they have a metabolic slowdown. Um, this increases the chance that germination will occur at a time and a place that is most in advantageous to the seedling. And breaking of dormancy often requires environmental cues um, like temperature or lighting cues or even um, the seed being moist enough to germinate. So if we look at the embryos of the seed, um, eudicot and monocot embryos are a little bit different. So if we look at the eudicot embryo, um, the embryonic access is attached to two thick cotyledons or seed leaves, right? We said dye is two cotyledons, so dicot there. Um, the epicotyl is above the cotyledons, um, the hypocotyl is below the cotyledons, and the radicel is the embryonic root. The pumule comprises the epicotyl, the young leaves, and the shoot apical meristem. And the seeds of some eudicots, like a castor bean, have thin cotyledons, um, and in those species, the cotyledons are going to absorb nutrients from the endosperm and transfer them to the embryo when the seed germinates.
If we look at the monocot embryo, um, a monocot embryo has only one cotyledon, right? Mono, one, so monocot, one cotyledon. They also have epicotyl, hypocotyl, and radicel. Um, grasses like maize, so corn, and wheat have a special cotyledon called a scutellum, um, and there's two sheaths that enclose the embryo of grasses, um, a coleoptile that covers the young shoot and a coleoriza that covers the young root. Um, you've heard the word or the root word riza lots of times before, so coleoriza should be relatively, I suppose, maybe easier to remember because the riza root word means root. As far as seed germination goes, seed germination and vegetative growth begin when the environmental conditions are um, appropriate for growth to occur, and germination depends on imbibition, which is the uptake of water um, due to low water potential of the dry seed. The embryonic root, which is the radicel, emerges first, and then the shoot tip breaks through the soil surface. And whenever I say that, like, oh, the root comes out first, like, that's what typically happens. Are there any times where there's atypical stuff? Sure. Like maybe if you germinate your own seeds and you start them off like in a moist paper towel or something like that, like, you know, let's say 99% of the time the root comes out first and then occasionally the shoot will come out first, but it's like very rare and, you know, um, people take a picture of it because it's so rare. So one semester I had a student who's like, oh, look, well, this happened and I got a picture of it. I'm like, you took a picture of it because it's, it's atypical. You wouldn't expect to see that. So we would expect the embryonic root or the radicel to emerge before the shoot, and that's really what happens the vast majority of the time. So here's just a couple examples of different kinds of plants and how they emerge. I'm not worried about you memorizing that, but I just think it's worth looking at. Um, some of you are maybe pretty familiar with this because you've maybe planted your own seedlings or grown a garden or things like that, and some of you maybe have um, done that and not paid attention, and some of you have maybe no idea. So it's worth kind of looking at the picture here and just seeing how different plants emerge differently. So number seven, true or false pollination is fertilization in plants. That is false. Pollination is when the pollen gets on the stigma. Fertilization is when the sperm gets to the egg. So be careful with that. Number eight, how does sperm reach the egg in flowering plants? I mean, that's kind of like a complicated question, I guess, but um, you've got pollination has to occur, the pollen tube has to germinate um, and reach the ovule, and then the sperm goes from the pollen tube um, into the embryo sac um, in the ovule. Number nine, what is the first part of the embryo to emerge from the seed? That should be the embryonic root, which is called the radicel. So fruit then is a structure that encloses and helps disperse seeds. So seed dispersal helps reduce competition and allows colonization of new sites. And fruits develop from an ovary and sometimes other parts. The ovary wall changes into the fruit wall, which we call the pericarp. And variation in mature fruits really reflects seed dispersal strategies or adaptations. Um, so there's a wide variety of seed dispersal adaptations, including um, dispersal through water with buoyant seeds um, or like a maple seed. Um, people call them different things, like a helicopter, whirly gig, if you heard that before. They're really called a keen, but yeah, you, you've seen it, hopefully. Um, so that is wind dispersal, and then obviously animals can disperse seeds as well. Um, they can either be taken into the animal and, um, you know, moved along someplace else and deposited with a nice pile of fertilizer, or they can attach to the animal. So here's just a couple pictures showing you different dispersal strategies there. There's water and wind um, and dispersal by an animal either in the poop or stuck on the animal. Um, oh, sorry, this would be stuck on the animal. This was a squirrel hoarding fruits um, or an ant carrying a seed there. As far as fruit classification goes, we can say a fruit is dry if the ovary dries out at maturity. We can say the fruit is fleshy if the ovary becomes thick and soft and sweet at maturity. And then we can also classify fruits as um, either simple or aggregate or multiple. They're a simple fruit if they came from a single or several fused carpels. They're an aggregate fruit if they came from a single flower with multiple separate carpels. And they're a multiple fruit if they came from a group of flowers called an inflorescence. Um, an accessory fruit contains other floral parts in addition to the ovaries.
So plants can do both asexual and sexual reproduction. So sexual reproduction is done by flowers and flowering plants um, or angiosperms and results in offspring that are genetically different from their parents. And asexual reproduction is the result of a clone. So you get a genetically identical organism. So there's apomixis and fragmentation. Apomixis and fragmentation we'll cover in a little bit more detail coming up here. But apomixis is asexual production of seeds from a diploid cell. Um, and fragmentation is where a, a chunk or a fragment of the parent plant um, develops into a whole new plant. So asexual reproduction or vegetative growth can be beneficial to a successful plant in a stable environment. Like if, if the environment's good for you at the time, might as well make a clone of you, take advantage of the environmental conditions. Um, sexual reproduction is energetically expensive, but sexual reproduction generates genetic variation um, and it makes evolutionary adaptation possible. So I mean, if we mix up these characteristics between these two individuals, we could have a better combination. We could also have a worse combination, but if we had a better combination, um, then that seedling is going to survive and reproduce more in subsequent generations as well. So that's why sexual reproduction still happens. So if we look at asexual reproduction, um, apomixis is kind of a unique example. With this, this is when you have seed production without fertilization. So fruits and seeds are produced in the absence of fertilization. So what happens is meiosis produces diploid megaspores. Typically, what's the end result of meiosis? Typically, meiosis, we go from diploid to haploid. But in this case, we're producing a diploid megaspore, um, which then leads to diploid eggs that develop into normal individuals without fertilization. So we get parthenocarpic fruit that develops without fertilization. A dandelion is a good example of this. And if you have ever tried to fight dandelions for whatever reason, um, you'll know that they reproduce very quickly. Um, and in part, they can do this because of this apomixis, which is a type of asexual reproduction. Fragmentation is another common type of asexual reproduction in plants. Um, this is when a portion of the parent plant develops into a whole new plant. So this could include plantlets, like in this example here. So these plantlets break off and become a whole new plant, or a bulb, or a tuber, like a potato. Um, if you've ever left your potato, like maybe you bought the big bag of potatoes to save some money, and then you used all the potatoes but one potato and that poor one potato was sitting in your drawer and started to grow into a whole new potato plant. Um, maybe you've experienced this before. We can also do tissue culture. So many kinds of plants are able to be produced ace, um, like clones of them or we can produce copies of them from plant fragments called cuttings. Um, so you can take a small fragment of a plant um, and Oftentimes, like you can just take that cutting of the plant and you know put it in water and it'll develop roots. Um, that's probably how you've done it before if you've done something like that. But you can even take a very small chunk of plant tissue um, and culture it on artificial medium, um, like a growth medium, and you'll get this callus of cells if you have a ratio of um, the plant hormones oxin and cytokinin of a one to one ratio and then you can actually encourage different parts of the plant to, to develop by changing the ratio of those hormones so if you want roots to develop you're going to need to have a 10 or greater than 10 to 1 ratio of oxin to cytokinin and if you want shoots to develop you're going to need to have a ratio that's less than 10 to 1 of oxin to cytokinin um, we would do tissue culture like this because it would allow us to um, make copies of plants that are genetically engineered, um, which could be helpful for research. Um, also, you could do tissue culture like this um, if you're trying to preserve an endangered species, things like that. Or even if you just want to grow a lot of the same kind of plant relatively rapidly. Um, grafting is another um, thing that you can do with closely related plants. So a twig or bud can be grafted onto a plant of a closely related species or variety. Um, the stalk provides the root system and then the scion is grafted onto that stalk. The scion is the plant that you want. So if you plant like an apple seed from the store, um, you are not going to grow an apple tree of that variety most likely. Um, so sometimes what we do is we take a rootstock that we want, um, 
Like, let's say we're trying to grow pawpaws. Um, that's a thing that people are starting to get back into in Missouri. So there's native pawpaws, and then there's improved pawpaws that have, like, a better fruit flavor or better fruit size or more stable fruit, things like that. Um, the native rootstock is probably going to do best in our area because it has a long history of living in this area where these improved varieties maybe won't do as well. So you could grow up a plant that is the native variety of pawpaw and then graft on the improved variety of pawpaw onto that rootstock there to get your better fruit but still your good rootstock that's able to live in this area. So that was chapter 30. Uh, again, chapter 30 is all about reproduction and domestication of the flowering plant. We talked about that alternation generations life cycle. I feel like we've gone over that so many times now that you should be good with it, but if you're still stuck, uh, definitely feel free to reach out. We also talked about flower anatomy. Um, so be able to label the parts of the flower and make sure you know if a flower is incomplete or complete. Um, we talked about the male and female gametophyte generation in angiosperms, make sure you know what those are. Um, Make sure you know the difference between fertilization and pollination. Uh, I don't know that it's tricky when people get to the test, but I think people come into this chapter not really knowing the difference there. Um, understand what gets fertilized with double fertilization and um, be able to describe the like what's in a seed, what a seed looks like, um, know roughly what a fruit is. Don't worry so much about um, the specific kinds of fruits, but know typically what a fruit comes from, be able to talk about the different kinds of asexual reproduction, and a little bit about tissue culture. So that's it for chapter 30.